Father, we come before your throne of grace once again today. I stand not as somebody who is qualified to tell anyone anything, but we pray this morning that the words that you have for us will be words that will change us and will draw us closer to you. O oh, blessed Father, look down upon us. We are your children. We need your love. We run before your throne of mercy and seek your face to rise above. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. I want to thank the pastor and the elders for sharing the pulpit with me. I am not a preacher by profession, so if I bore you too much, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll stop. Um, our reading today, our study today is going to be based from the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and 2 Kings chapter 23. And the title of our discussion this morning is A Different Standard, and that is a question. Is it a different standard? Today we look into the life of Josiah, the boy king. Um, he came into power when he was only eight years old, and that is not to say that an eight-year-old can lead, but an eight-year-old can be surrounded with people of influence. The name Josiah means the Lord saves, and it is similar in meaning to Yeshua, which we know today as Jesus, and the meaning of that word is the Lord is my salvation. So what do we know about King Josiah? He became king when the kingdom of Israel was already in captivity. The genealogy of, his, of Josiah goes something like this. One of his um, great, great, great um, grandfather Ahaz was evil. Hezekiah, who came into power after King Ahaz, was right with the Lord. And then right after Hezekiah came Manasseh. And the Bible records Manasseh as being the most evil king that ever reigned in Judah. What happened during Manasseh's reign? Any semblance of true religion and true worship were destroyed. He acted more wickedly than all the Amorites who were before him, and he made Judah sin. Some of the things we know about Manasseh is he worshipped anything that God had created. He worshipped the stars, and he worshipped the moon, and he worshipped the sun. But we know him more for offering his children as burnt sacrifice and for forcing his children to walk through fire. And history tells us that during his reign, during the reign of King Manasseh, the prophet Isaiah was sown into half because Manasseh was not going to listen to him. The Bible records that Manasseh seduced Judah, not just Judah, but Jerusalem, to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Never had Israel had such a wicked king. He did much in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. But everything else that happened with Manasseh, we see that towards the end of his life, he repents. And through the mercies of God, he is saved. But his evil had already been done. The harm that he had led the children of Israel to do was already there. And then right after Manasseh, his son Ammon comes into power. And for lack of a better word, like father, like son. Ammon is a sinner. And he's evil. And then right after Ammon, everyone is killed in the kingdom. And we have an eight-year-old called to lead. And if you turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 34, Second Chronicles, chapter 34, verse 1, the Bible records and says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in, Jeruz in Judah. Well, he was only eight years old, but he had 30 plus years to reign in the kingdom of Judah. And it is recorded, and for King Josiah, this is the only king in both the Israel kingdom and in the kingdom of Judah where the Bible records and says that he did that, was, that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. He stayed on the path. He is 
the last good king. He is the best of all the kings that we have in the Bible. He is also one of the kings who gets an honorable mention in the genealogy of Jesus. And under the reign of Josiah, the kingdom of Judah had the longest and the best revival and reformation. And yet, he only came into power at the age of eight. So today, the two questions that we are going to attempt to ask ourselves are projected up there for you. The first question is, what do we have to do for a reformation and a revival, such as the one led by Josiah, to sweep our lives, and not just our lives, but to sweep our church? And then the second question, which is where we get the title of our sermon today, is, does God have a different standard for this, the final generation, or not, that he had, than he has had for all the previous generations? So are we judged by a different standard just because we're here? Are we judged by a different standard because we are not in the kingdom of Judah? Are we judged by a different standard because we get a pass? That is the question for all of us today. And so you're wondering, International Women's Day of Prayer, what are we doing talking about Manasseh? But we cannot have prayer, and we cannot have fellowship, and we cannot have testimony if we're not revived. Otherwise, it becomes just another program. So looking into King Josiah, the first things that King Josiah did, and we're going to study this together, is in Second Chronicles 34, 1 to 3, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Verse 3, then in the eighth year of his reign, so if he became king at age eight, in the eighth year, how old was he? Sixteen. So in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the 20th year, so how old is he now? In the 20th year of his reign, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. So the first thing that Josiah does is he seeks God. He knows his heritage. He knows where he come from. There are a bunch of evil sinners who have sat on the throne. He comes in young, inexperienced. He seeks the way of the Lord, and he wants to do what is right. And if we go back into um, the book of Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 20, we are told that you shall, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it whether you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. And this is what the King Josiah is doing. Is he is seeking to have a close walk with God. He is seeking to have that relationship with God. And this is where one of the things I want to let us know this morning is without a personal walk with God, regardless of what we do, it just becomes another program. You have to have that personal walk with God. You have to know that I am here, but I need to have that personal walk with God. Otherwise, you might as well just call it quits. So the first thing that we see King Josiah doing on behalf of his nation is he seeks God, and he seeks to walk with God, and he seeks to follow God. And then the second thing that he does is he purges that which is opposed to God. We know the history of Manasseh, evil king. During his reign, all form of semblance of religion has been kicked out of um, Jerusalem and Judah. And so at this time, I'll ask you to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 23. Starting from verse 3, the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandment and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and his soul to perform the words of the covenant. If you go to verse 4, and the king commanded the priest, the priests of the second order and the doorkeepers, to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them down outside of Jerusalem. Verse 6, 
and he brought out the wooden image from the house of the Lord to the brook Kidron outside Jerusalem and burnt it at the brook Kidron, granted in ashes and threw its ashes in the graves of the common people. Verse 7. Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the wooden images. Verse 8, And he brought all the priests from the cities of Judah, defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba, and he also broke down the high places at the gates which were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city. And as you read through the book of 2 Kings chapter 23, he is cleaning house. And at this time, he is only 26 years old, but he is cleaning house. He is cleansing the temple. He is removing any semblance of idol worship. He is removing any graven images. He went as far as Jerusalem. At this point, you have to remember that the other kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, is already in captivity. He just doesn't stop with the He goes out to do the other piece as well. He removed the false priests. And what struck me as I read through this, if you read... Um, Chapter 23 of 2 Kings and verse 13. Um, then the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, which were on the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth and the abomination of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the abom abomination of the Moabites, and for Malcolm, the abomination of the people of Ammon. So where people before him had only come and done a little cleaning, he goes all the way up. We have to remember that Solomon is a revered king. He is wise. So nobody wanted to go against him. But we see here that Josiah is bold enough to go all the way back and remove the abomination that he had created. <clears throat> and um, in contrast with previous purges by Asa and Hezekiah, Josiah dared to eliminate monuments in Solomon's apostasy. So he is cleaning house. And he's not just stopping with the little place he has. He is going back. The children of Israel have sinned. He has decided he's going to follow God. He has sought God, and he's purging the temple. And so my question to us this morning is, what do we need to purge from our homes? What do we need to purge from our lives? What do we need to purge from those places where we have influence? You know, what song selections do we have in our iPods and in our iPads? What movies do we have in our libraries? And how is our language? Do we have two of us when we're with one group of people we speak this way, and then we're with this other group of people we speak this way? And how much time are we spending on the internet? I know we live in the day and age where technology is it. If you don't have the internet, you're stuck in the dark ages. But how much time are you spending on the internet? And how many compromises have we made just this week alone? You know, Solomon was one of the wisest kings that lived on the face of the earth. And yet the Bible records, as we have read, that he had a mountain of corruption. He built it to pacify his wife. He built it to pacify his wife's family. So what compromises have we made? And one of my favorites is how much television are we watching? How much of it is good television and how much of it is bad television? So as I was preparing for the sermon, I got, I thought, well, you know what? Uh, television watching is really not that bad in the United States because we all have to work two jobs to make ends meet and then after the two jobs we have to go to school and then after school we have to go to soccer practice and we are taking kids from point A to point B so we definitely don't have time to watch television, amen? Okay. <laughs> so, Americans continue to consume video at a record pace. Consumers are watching more video than ever on the three screens of television, internet, and mobile phones. Nielsen data show that the average television viewer watches more than 151 hours of television per month 
an all-time high. Meanwhile, Americans, watch video over the, Americans who watch video over the internet consume another three hours of online monthly video, and those who use mobile video watch nearly four hours per month on mobile phones and other devices. So 151 plus three plus four is 160 hours a month. That is average. TV watching at an all-time high, Nielsen says. 160 hours. That's just the average American. I don't know where in the spectrum of average you fall or I fall, but is yours on the high end of the 160 or is yours on the very low end of the 160? Where do you fall? And we always have the best reasons why we watch television. I've had a long day, I need to wind down, I'm too tired to think, it's background noise. Where is your compromise? When Josiah started to purge, he did not purge halfway. He looked at everything. What do we need to purge? What do we need to do in our lives to have that walk with God? Where do we stand in our interactions with other people? Where is your stand today, Katie? Where is my stand today? Or will somebody have to come into my life and clean house? And as they clean house, it is going to hurt and hurt and hurt. Where do we stand? Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So as you sit down and you watch the television, as you sit down and you play on the internet, as you sit down and do whatever you do, is any of that praiseworthy? Is any of that noble? Is any of that of good report? So my challenge to all of us today, because I know in one way or the other, we all are addicted to television. Next time when you sit to watch television, or when you sit to play on your gadget, or when you sit to play on the internet, pull up an extra chair and sit Jesus next to you. And as you watch it, ask him, turn around every few seconds and say, Jesus, is this fun? Are you having fun? Are you enjoying it? When you're having those conversations, when your language is in and out, take Jesus with you and say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to talk to Mr. Keith this way, and I'm going to talk to Miss Rochelle this way. You tell me which one is the best, because we have to look inward. We have to look at our lives. Are we willing to purge? Are we willing to be as honest? And as sincere as the 26-year-old king of Judah was, he was 26 years old when he started to purge the kingdom. And he did not stop at purging. So he's cleaned. He cleans everything. And then they find the book of the law in the temple. And as the book of the law is read to him, he renders his clothes. He is so upset because he knows they have fallen so far away from the original intent that God had for them. And he sends for the prophet, he sends to us the prophetess, what are we to do? And the prophetess tells him, this has to come to pass because you have all fallen away. But it will not come to pass in your lifetime because you are trying to repair what was broken. And so Josiah comes up. He knows what he needs to do. And we are told in 2 Chronicles chapter 34, 32 to 33, and he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to take a stand. So he has purged 
the kingdom of any idol worship of anything against the law of God. And as the leader of the time, he takes a stand and he forces, he does not force his will on them, but he makes them take a stand. And so this is where we come in today is we are going to purge. Yes, you're going to stop the television. Yes, you're going to stop the, you know, and not so clean mouth. Yes, you're going to change your diet. But after you have changed, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to take it and keep it? I'm changed. That's it. You have to take a stand. And if you read through 2 Chronicles 30, 34, 32 to 33, he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. And all his days they did not depart from following the God of their fathers. Notice one thing that he doesn't do is he doesn't force them to take his stand. And that takes us back to that scripture that we read this morning. Choose you whom this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is essentially what Josiah is telling the children of Judah is, this is my stand. This is where I stand. You have to make your choice. And then you look at me and you say, but I'm not a leader. I'm not the pastor of that church. I'm not the elder. I'm not the deacon. I'm not the deaconess. I'm not the greeter. I can't take a stand. Yes, you can. If you're in this congregation today and you're a mother, you're a father, or you're a brother or a sister, you are a leader. If the kids in your classes look up to you, you're a leader. If you lead a ministry in the church, you're a leader. If you work in a building that is not just run by you, there is two or three or maybe a hundred or seven hundred or a thousand other people, you're a leader. So you have to take a stand. You, you cannot waver. You have influence. You cannot force them to take the same stand you're taking, but you can require them to take a stand. So who are you going to require to take a stand? Are you requiring yourself to take a stand? Are you going to require your children to take a stand? Are you going to require your coworkers to take a stand? At some point, you, like Josiah, has to require people to take a stand. And what stand are you going to ask them to take? What stand are you going to require them to take? If you have influence, Katie Church, if you're a person of influence at school or in the church or at home, you are a leader and you are required to take a stand. So question, what do we have to do for that reformation and that revival that happened in 2 Kings and in 2 Chronicles? What do we have to do for it to happen here in Katy? What do we have to do for it to happen here in our church? What do we have to do for it to happen in our lives? And second question, are we held by a different standard? We are the last generation living before the second coming. Are we held by a different standard, a standard different than what is in 2 Kings and what is in 2 Chronicles? Are we held by a different standard? You know, in this day and age, we live in a culture that is ripe with political correctness. And as the last generation before the second coming of Christ, we can definitely not demand morality, and we become accustomed, so accustomed to the way of the world that sometimes you walk into church or you look into our lives and you have to wonder, which side are we on? Are we on the side that's out to please everyone else, or are we on the side that's out to please God? And we have allowed the cultures of the world to permeate our lives, to permeate our walk with Christ. 
which side are you going to walk on? But we don't live in the days of Manasseh because, unlike Manasseh, we do not make our children or those whom we have influence over walk over fire. We do not offer them to any idol gods. We do not force them to worship a wooden image. We just sit them in front of a computer or sit them in front of a television or seat ourselves in front of either and then we let ourselves get entertained and let ourselves have fun. We just don't offer our children as sacrifices anymore. That is unheard of. If you did that today, you'd end up in jail for the rest of your life. So you're not going to do that. You're not going to force somebody else to do that. You're just going to make sure they're entertained. And we do not have wooden images in our homes. We just choose which commandments to keep and when we are going to keep them. And like Sister Karan reminded us this morning during Sabbath school, how we are going to keep the commandments. But we don't live in those days because we don't have to live in those days. We're privileged. And unlike Isaiah, who was sown in half for his faith, as of today, nobody has threatened to sow you in half, at least not that I know of. Or nobody has threatened to sow your child in half. But we're just not so comfortable speaking about our faith. If I ran into, if somebody ran into you on the street and asked you, who do you believe in? And what do you believe in? What would you say? Would you give them the message? Would you give them a steps to Christ? Not that there's anything wrong with giving a steps to Christ, but do you believe in the steps to Christ? Or would you give them every day with Jesus? Or would you give them a Bible? Or would you take five minutes of your busy schedule to share what you believe in with them? But nobody's threatening to sow us in half, not yet. We live in a privileged society, and as I prepared, I realized how privileged I was. I had, I have the Bible at the tips of my fingers. If you have a cell phone and it has 3G, 4G, whatever connectivity you have, you have it at the tips of your fingers. And I don't mean to offend anyone today, but silent poll, how many of us came in today with a hard copy Bible versus a Bible on the gadget? You do not have to raise your hands. This is where our faith is going. We have so much convenience that we forget how blessed we are, and we take it for granted. Question. How can he dwell amongst us when we're so busy? How can he dwell amongst us when we're getting entertained with other things? How can we dwell amongst us when we don't know him, when we have not taken that stand, when we have not purged what we need to purge? How is he supposed to dwell amongst us? I submit to you this morning that as that last generation, before the second return of Christ, we have to take a stand. The light is shining on each and every one of us. What are we doing with it? What are you doing with the light that is given you? Have you taken it and hidden it under your bed? because you're not comfortable? Have you taken it and passed it on to somebody else because it's not your responsibility? Have you fallen so far off that when people look at you, they wonder whether you're really a Seventh-day Adventist or better yet, a Christian, because they look at you and they compare you with them and they don't see any difference? That light is shining upon us today. Realize Josiah did not ask anyone else to make the stand fast. He made the stand fast. He did not delegate to somebody else. He did not delegate the reformation of Israel to somebody else. He stood up and had his stand, and he had his voice. 
Have you start, stood up today? When was the last time you stood up for your faith? When was the last time somebody asked you what you believed in and who you believed in and you had the answer at the tip of your voice, at the tip of your tongue? When was the last time you did that? Sabbath school this morning, we studied about Stephen. He had the answers there. But he had taken time to seek God. He had taken time to purge and he had taken time to study. How much studying are you doing? You know, we, are, we, are, we live in a world that is so politically correct that there's phrases like non-committed committal. What is that? We do, but we don't. Ah, we are, but we, we really aren't. You know, we're taking a stand, but we're not taking a stand. It's, it's my fault, but it's not my fault. I believe, but I don't believe. Where are you standing today? It is not the next person seated to your right or to your left that has to make the stand. You have to make your own stand. And so where are you in your walk with Christ? When was the last time you made a stand? We have examples in the Bible of people who took a stand. Elijah on the Mount of Carmel, he says, you believe what you believe and I will believe what I will believe. We read about Joshua this morning, giving the children of Israel an ultimatum. You believe what you believe, but my family and I, myself first, this is what I will believe. John the Baptist believed. Stephen was stoned for his faith. If the Sanhedrin was here today, would you stand up? Would you be stoned for your faith? Or will you be the one doing the stoning because what is coming out of somebody else's mouth is so offensive to you, you know better. But you have caused yourself to be so blinded by the things that are holding you down that when somebody else brings it to light, you get offended. Where is your stand? Where is my stand? That is the question we need to ask ourselves. And so we go back to what do we need to purge? What do we need to give up? How much television is enough television? How much television is entertainment? How much news is enough news? How many movies are good enough for us to watch? Is my language always the language that Christ wants me to have? Is my interaction with others the same regardless of who they are? I treat them like they are the child of God. I show them that I know who I believe in. I know who I trust. How many compromises are enough compromises, Katie? How many? At what point do we say enough is enough? We are standing for God. We are standing for what is right. At what point? We don't have to go far. We have the Bible. We have the message. Where is my stand today? Where is your stand today? I cannot make it for you. I can make one for myself. Have you made one? Have you made one in your office? If we came to your workplace today and we asked them who they are, will they say, oh, that's the person that, you know, blank, 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 blank? Or will they say, this is the person that shares the word of God with me? If we came to your school during recess, what would they say? Where? is your stand. Today we have the freedom to worship without being persecuted, and we take that for granted. But there will come a time when you will have to defend your faith. But how will you defend your faith if you do not have a stand? How will you defend the Bible if you do not know what the Bible says? How will you say I am a Christian, I am a follower of Christ, if you haven't the slightest clue what Christ did for you? How is your stand? Are we held by a different standard? In this age, just prior to the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven, God calls for men and women who will prepare a people to stand in the great day of the Lord. Just such a work 
as that which John did, is to be carried in these last days with the earnestness that characterized Elijah the prophet and John the Baptist, we are to strive to prepare the way for Christ's second advent. This is taken from Sister White's learning um, readings. I ask you today, where is your stand? We have two teenagers who in 2006 stood up against the ACLU so they could recite the Lord's Prayer during their graduation. What has that got to do with you? You're able to say prayer. You have the privilege of going to a Christian school. Somebody cannot come up to you and say, don't pray, because that is where you are. But what will they ask of you to do? Almost two years later, Megan and Mandy um, completed their sophomore year. Since arriving at Liberty, Megan has been volunteering. There's even more to this story. When CNN headline news wanting to feature Liberty Council in their series, God's Warriors, uh, they intro we introduced um, CNN correspondent Christian Amanpour to the twins. The story of Megan and Mandy and their faith has now been shown several times in the world in the two-hour documentary called God's Christian Soldiers. And that's just because they chose to want to say the Lord's Prayer during a graduation. They took a little small stand, but that stand has made a difference. And so I ask us this morning in conclusion, where is your stand? Are there days you wake up and you don't know that you have a stand? Are there days that you're scared? that you'll be forced to take a stand when you're not ready to take one? And when that time comes, will your anchor hold? Will you stand and say, I know whom I have believed, and I will follow him to death, even death on the cross? Are you ready to do that? Are we held by a different standard, or are we held by the same standard? That is the question today. Amen.